Nothing is more common form in old-fashioned books than the description of the winter fireside where the aged grandam narrates to the circle of children that hangs upon her lips story after story of ghosts and fairies and inspires her audience with a pleasing terror. But you see, we're never allowed to know what the stories were. We hear, it's true, of sheeted spectres with saucer eyes and, still more intriguingly, of raw head and bloody bones, an expression which the Oxford Dictionary actually traces back to 1550. But the, the context of these striking images eludes us. Here, you see, is, is a problem which is, has long obsessed me, but I, I see no means of solving it. The aged grandams are gone, of course, and the, the collectors of folklore began their work in England too late to save most of the stories which the grandams told. Yet such things do not easily die quite out, and imagination, working on scattered hints, may be able to devise a picture of an evening's entertainment. Let us try now. So the the squire, exhausted by a long day after partridges and replete with food and drink, is snoring on one side of the fireplace. His old mother sits opposite him, knitting, and, and the children, Charles and Fanny, are gathered about her knee. Now, my dears, you must be very good and quiet, or you'll wake your father, and you know what'll happen then. Yes, I know, Granny. He'll be woundy cross-tempered and send us off to bed. <gasps> Charles, fie upon you! That's no way to speak. Now, I was going to have told you a story, but if you use words like that, then I shan't. Oh, Granny, please, I'm sorry. Do, 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 do. Now, you be good and sit still now. And you too, Fanny. And I, 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 I'll tell you what. Tomorrow, you can go a blackberrying. Hmm? And if you bring home a nice basketful, I'll make you some jam. Oh, yes, Granny, do. And, and I know where the, the best blackberries are. I saw them today. Oh, and where's that boy? Well, in, in the, the little lane that goes up past Mrs. Collins's cottage. <gasps> no, no, child. Don't, don't you dare to pick one single blackberry in that lane. You hear me? Why, don't you know... No, well, as likely as not, you don't. But, but anyway, you mind what I say, and you leave that lane well alone. But, but why, Granny? What, why shouldn't we pick blackberries there? <laughs> Your father's sleeping. Very well, then. I'll tell you all about it. Only you, you mustn't interrupt me. Hmm? Now, let me see. It was when I was quite a little girl. That lane had a bad name, although it seems that people don't remember so much about it now. And one day I told my poor mother when I come home to my supper, a summer evening it was, I remember, I told her where I'd been for my walk and how I'd come back down that lane. And I asked her how it was that there were those current and gooseberry bushes growing in a little patch at the top of the lane. And... <gasps> Dear me, such a taking she was in. She shook me and she slapped my face and she said, You naughty, naughty child, haven't I forbid you twenty times over to never set foot in that lane and here you go dawdling about it at night time. Well, when she was finished, I was almost too much taken back to say anything, but I, I made her believe that it was the first that I'd heard of it and, well, that, that, that was the truth of the matter. And then she said that she was sorry she'd been so short with me and to make it up, she told me the whole story after my supper. And since then, I, I've, I've often heard the same thing from the old people in the place. And, and I have my own reasons besides for thinking that there was something in it. Now, you see, up at the far end of that lane, let me see, is it on the, the right or the left side as you go up it? It's on the left-hand side, that's right. You'll find a little patch of bushes and rough ground in the field, and, and something like a, a broken old hedge all about it. And as you know, sit yourselves, there's some, some old gooseberry and currant bushes growing among it. 
Well, that means, of course, you see, that there was a, a cottage standing there once, and in that cottage, before I was born or thought of, there lived a man named Davis. Now, I've heard that he wasn't born in the parish, and it's true that nobody of that name has been living about here since I've known the place, but however that may be, this Mr. Davis lived very much to himself. You know, very seldom went to the public house and never worked for any of the farmers. It seemed that he had enough money of his own to, to get along. But he'd go to the town on market days, you see, and one day he came back from the market and brought a young man with him. And this young man and Mr. Davis lived together for some time and went about together. Now, whether he just did the work of the house for Mr. Davis or whether Mr. Davis was his teacher in some way, nobody seemed to know. He, he, I've heard that he was a, a pale, ugly young fellow and, and he hadn't much to say for himself. Well, now, what did those two men do with themselves? I mean, of course, I can't tell you half the, the foolish things that the people got into their heads. And we know, don't we, that you mustn't speak evil when you aren't sure that it's true, even when people are dead and gone. But as I said, these two men, they're always together, out, early and late, up on the downland and, and below in the woods. And there was one walk in particular that they take regularly once a month to the place where, where you, you've seen that wicked old figure cut out on the hillside. And it was noticed that in the summer time, when they took that walk, they'd camp out there all night, either there or, or, or somewhere close by. I, I remember once my father told me that he, he'd spoken to Mr Davis about it. It was his land that Mr Davis lived on, and, and he asked him why he was so fond of going up there. But all Mr Davis said was, Oh, it's a wonderful old place, sir. And I've always been fond of the old-fashioned things. And when him, he meant the young man that was with him all the time, when him and me are up there together, it seems to bring the old times back so plain. And my father said, Well, it may suit you, Mr Davis, but I shouldn't like a lonely place like that in the middle of the night myself. And Mr Davis smiled, and the young man who'd been listening said, Oh, we don't want for company at such times, sir. And my father said he couldn't help thinking Mr Davis gave him some kind of a sign with his hand, and the young man went on quick, as if to mend his words. That is to say, Mr Davis and me's company enough for each other, ain't we, Mr Davis? And then there's a beautiful air there of a summer night, and, and you can see all the country round under the moon, and it looks so different to what it do in the daytime. Why... All them barrows on the down. And then Mr. Davis cut in and said, Oh, yeah, they're old-fashioned places, ain't they? Now, what would you think, sir? What would you think was the purpose of them, them barrows? Well, I, I, I've heard that... Well, I've heard, Mr. Davis, that they're all graves, said my father. And, and, and indeed, when I've had occasion to plough one up, there's always been some old bones and pots and so forth turned over. But whose graves they are is quite another matter. Uh, people say that the, the ancient Romans were hereabouts at one time, but whether they buried their people like that or not, I, I've no idea. And Mr. Davis shook his head and said, I you know, sir, they, they, they look to me older than the ancient Romans, and... And dress different. Oh, yes, that, that is to say, according to the pictures, the Romans was in armour, and, and you didn't ever find no armour, did you, sir, about, by what you said? Well, my father was rather surprised, and he said, oh, I don't think I mentioned anything about armour, no. But, but it's true, I don't remember ever having found any, but, but you talk as if you'd seen them, Mr Davis. And they, they both of them laughed, Mr. Davis and the young man, and, and Mr. Davis said, Seen him, sir! Oh, now, that would be a difficult matter after all these years. Not that I shouldn't like well enough to know more about them old times and the people and, 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 and what they worshipped and all. Worshipped, said my father. Well, I dare say they worshipped the old man on the hill. Ah, indeed, said Mr. Davis. Well, I, I shouldn't wonder as you're right. And, and, and my, my father went on and told them what he'd heard and read about you know, the, the heathens and their, their nasty sacrifices. And they seemed to be very much interested, Mr Davis and the young man. But my father said he couldn't help thinking that most of what he was saying was no news to them. Well, that was about the, the only time 
he ever had much talk with Mr. Davis, but it's it stuck in his mind, my father said, particularly the young man's word about not wanting for company. It, because, well, you see, in those days there was, there was a lot of talk in the villages round about, and, well, I mean, but, but for my father's interfering, the people would have ducked an old lady for a witch. What, what, what does that mean, Granny? D ducked an old lady for a witch? Are there witches round here? Oh, no, no! No, 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 dear, no, 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 don't you worry yourself, that's quite a different affair, I shouldn't have mentioned it, no, 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 what I mean is that the, the people in other places round about believed that some sort of meetings went on at night time, or on the hill, you know, where the, the big man is, and, 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 and that those who went there were up to no good, well, I, I suppose it was a matter of about three years that, Mr. Davis and his young man went on living together, and then all of a sudden the dreadful thing happened. Now, I, I really, I, I don't think I ought to tell you about it. Oh, yes, Granny, you must, please. Oh, no, 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 it, it's too much for young ears. Oh, Granny, please, please, oh, all right, all right. But you, you must promise not to get frightened and go screaming out in the middle of the night. Very well, then. Well, one morning, early towards the turn of the year, I think it was in September, it was about this time of year, one of the woodmen had to go up to his work at the top of the, the long covert, just as it was getting light. And just where there were some big oaks in a sort of clearing deep in the wood, he saw at a distance a white thing looked like a man through the mist. And he was in two minds about going on at all, but he did go on. And he made out as he came near that it was a man, and more than that, that it was Mr. Davis's young man, dressed in a, a, a sort of white gown he was, and hanging to the limb of the biggest oak by his neck, quite, quite dead. And near his feet there lay on the ground a hatchet, all in a gore of blood. Well, what a sight that was for anyone to come upon in that lonely place. The poor man was very nearly out of his wits. He dropped what he was carrying, ran as hard as ever he could down to the parsonage, and he, he woke them up and told them what he'd seen. And old Mr. White, who, who was the parson back then, he sent him off to get two or three of the best men, you know, the, the blacksmith and the church wardens and so forth, while he dressed himself. Well, all of them went up to this dreadful place and they took a horse to lay the body on to bring it back. And, and when they got there, everything was just as the woodman had said. And a, a, a terrible shock it was to them all to see how the corpse was dressed, especially to old Mr. White, because it seemed to him, he, he told my father this, it seemed to him to be like a mockery of the church surplus, only not in the same fashion of it. And when they come to, to take the, the body down from the oak, they found that there was a chain of, of some metal around the young man's neck and a little ornament like a wheel hanging out on the front. Very old-looking thing, they said. Now, in the meantime, they'd sent off a boy to run to Mr. Davis's house and to see whether he was at home. And Mr. White said that they must send to the constable too and they must get a message to a magistrate. So there was a, a good deal of running hither and thither. And when they laid the body across the horse, it was all that they could do to keep the beast from bolting away. But eventually they got it through the wood and back into the village street. And there, just by the big tree where, where the stocks are, they found a lot of women gathered together. And this boy, whom they'd sent to Mr. Davis's house, lying in the middle of the street, white as paper, trembling, and not a word could they get from him. Well, they guessed, of course, that there was, there was still worse to come, and they made their way up the lane to Mr. Davis's house, and when they got near it, the horse seemed to go mad again with fear, reared up and screamed, struck out with its forefeet, and the man that was leading was as near as possible to being killed, and the dead body fell off its back, so Mr. White bid them to get the horse away, and they carried the body straight into the living room, because the door stood open. And then they saw what it was 
that had given that poor young boy such a fright and why the horse had gone mad. There was a long table in the room and on that table lay the body of Mr Davis. The eyes were bound over with a linen band and the arms were tied across the back and the feet were bound together with another band. But the fearful thing was that the breast was bare and the bone of it was split through from the top downwards with an axe. It was a terrible sight to see. I'm not one there but turned faint with it and had to go out into the fresh air. Even Mr White, who was what you might call a hard nature of a man, even he was overcome and, and said a prayer for strength in the garden. But at last they laid out the other body as best they could in the room and searched about to see if they could find out how such a frightful thing had come to pass. And in the cupboards they found a quantity of herbs and jars with liquors and, and it came out when people understood there were people who understood such matters as looked into it that some of these liquors were drinks that were there to put a person to sleep and they had little doubt that that wicked young man had put some of this into mr davis's drink and then used him as he did and after that the sense of his sin had come upon him and he'd cast himself away well now you children you you couldn't understand all the law business that had to be done by the coroner and the, the magistrates and so forth. But there, there, there was a great coming and going over the next day or two. And then the people of the parish got together and they agreed that they could not bear the thought of those two men being buried in the churchyard alongside of Christian people. Because I, I, I'm afraid I must tell you that there were certain papers and writings found in the drawers and cupboards and Mr White and some other clergymen put their names to a piece of paper that said that these men were guilty by their own allowing of the dreadful sin of idolatry. And they feared that there were some in the neighbouring places that were not themselves free from that wickedness. And they called upon them all to repent at once, lest the, the same fearful thing that was come to these men should befall them also. And, and they burnt those writings entirely. So then, late one evening, twelve men went with Mr White to that evil house. And, and, and with them they took two beers made very roughly for the purpose, and two pieces of black cloth. And down at the crossroad, where, where you take the turn for, for Bascom and Wilkham, there were other men waiting with torches, who dug a pit, and, and a great crowd of people gathered round from all about. And, and the men that went to the cottage went in with their hats on their heads, and four of them took the two bodies and laid them on the biers and covered them over with the black cloths, and no one said a word this whole time, but they bore them down the lane, and then they were cast into the pit, and covered over with stones and earth, and then Mr White spoke to the people that were gathered together. My, my, my father, he, he was there himself, and he said that he'd never forget the, the strangeness of that sight, the torches burning, and those two black things huddled together in the pit and not a sound from, from any of the people standing around except it might be a child or a woman whimpering with fright. And so when Mr White had finished speaking, they all turned away and left them lying there. I mean, they, they, they say that the horses don't like that spot even now. And I've heard that there was something like a mist or a light hung about for a long time afterwards. But, well, I... I I can't say that I know the truth of that. But this I do know, that the next day, my father's business took him past the opening of that lane, and he saw three or four little knots of people standing at different places along it, seemingly in a state of mind about something. And he rode up to them and asked them what was the matter. And they ran up to him and they said, Oh, Squire, it's the blood. Look at the blood. So he got off his horse and they showed him and there in four places I think it was he saw great patches of blood on the road but he could hardly see that it was blood because 
almost every spot of it was covered with great black flies that never changed or moved at all. And that blood was what had fallen out of Mr. Davis's body as they bore him down the lane. Well, my father couldn't bear to do more than just take in that nasty sight. And then he said to one of those men that was there, make haste, he said, and fetch a barrow of clean earth out of the churchyard and spread it over those places. And I'll wait here till you come back. And very soon this, this man from the village came back and, and, and the, he brought the sexton with him, with the shovel and, and the earth in the handbarrow. And they set it down at the first of these places and they, they made ready to, to cast the earth upon it. And as ever they did that, what do you think? The flies that were upon it rose up in the air in a kind of solid cloud and moved off up the lane towards the house. And the sexton stopped and looked at them, and then he said to my father, Lord of the flies, sir. And that's all he said. Lord of the flies. But what, what, what did he mean, Granny? What? Lord of the flies? Oh, well, Charles, you, you ask Mr Lucas when you go to him for your lesson tomorrow. Anyway, the next thing was my father made up his mind that no one was going to live in that cottage again, although it was one of the best in the village. So he sent around word to the people that it was to be done away with and anyone that wished could bring a faggot for the burning of it. And, and well, that, that is what was done. They built a pile of wood in the living room, loosened the thatch so that the, the fire could take good hold and... They, they, they set it alight, and soon it was all gone. But the, the brick chimney, I, I remember seeing that, that chimney when I was a little girl, but that fell down of its own accord in the end as well. Well, you may be sure that for a long time afterwards, folks said that Mr Davis and his young man could be seen about the place. The one of them in the wood, and both of them, where the house had been, or passing together down the lane, particularly in the spring of the year I, I, and at the autumn time. I, 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 I can't speak of that myself, of course, although if there are such things as ghosts, it would seem likely that people like that would not rest quiet. But this I can tell you, that one evening in the month of March, just before your grandfather and I were married, We'd been taking a long walk in the woods together, picking flowers and talking, as young people will do, who, who were courting. And we, we, we were so much taken up with each other that we took no particular notice of where we were going. And on a sudden, I cried out. Ah! And, and your, your grandfather asked me what was the matter. And the matter was that I had felt a sharp prick on the back of my hand, and I snatched it to me, and I saw a black thing on it, and stuck it away with the other hand, and killed it. And I showed it to your grandfather, and he said, Well, I've never seen a fly like that before. Then we looked about us, and lo and behold, if we were not in that very lane, just in front of the place where the the cottage had once stood, and, as they told me afterwards, just at the spot where the men set down the beers a minute when they brought the bodies out of the garden gate. Well, you can be sure that we, we made haste from there. I mean, whether there was anything about more than we could see, I, I, I can never be entirely sure. Perhaps it was partly the, the venom of that horrid fly's bite that made me feel so strange, because, dear me, how my poor arm and hand swelled up after that. I'm, I'm afraid to tell you how large it was around, and the, the pain of it, too. I mean, nothing my mother could put on it had any power, and, and it wasn't until she was persuaded by her old nurse to get the wise man over at Bascombe to come and look at it that I, I got any peace at all. But you see, he, he seemed to know all about it, and he said that I, I wasn't the first that had been taken that way. When the sun's gathering his strength, he said, and when he's in the height of it, and when he's beginning to lose his hold, and when he's in his weakness, them as haunts about that lane had best to take heed of themselves. 
Uh, well, what, what it was that he bound on my arm and what, what words he said over it, he, he would never tell us. But after that, I, I quickly, I got well again. And since then, I've heard often enough of, of other people suffering, much the same as I did. Only, only of late years, it, it doesn't seem to happen, but very seldom. And, and well, maybe things like that do die out in the course of time. But anyway, Charles and Fanny, that is the reason why I say to you that I will not have you gathering me blackberries, no, nor eating of them either, in that lane. And now you know all about it, I don't fancy that you'll want to do it yourselves. Hmm? Now, off to bed with you this minute. What? A light in your room? The idea of such a thing. You, you get yourself undressed at once and say your prayers. And perhaps... If your father doesn't want me when he wakes up, I'll come and say good night to you. And Charles, if I hear anything of you frightening your little sister on the way up to bed, I shall tell your father that very moment, and you know what happened to you last time. The door closes, and Granny, after listening intently for a minute or two, resumes her knitting. The squire slumbers on. <laughs>